Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the grade 9 math sample questions from the 2024 SHSAT student handbook. Um, these questions are supposed to like simulate or represent how the uh, math questions on the uh, ninth grade SHSAT are supposed to look like and feel like. Uh, this is probably the best thing uh, you can do to you know, get a feel for how you're actually going to do all the tests, right? So we're going to start off with number one, which says that a function is given on the coordinate plane, right? So this is a coordinate plane and this is uh, a function, right? We know that the line is straight, so it's linear. So that's just something to note. And it tells us the function is linear down here too, right? So it's, it's asking us, what is the y value for x is equal to negative four, right? So whenever I have a uh, function and I know that it's linear, right? What that tells me is I'm gonna be working with the formula y is equal to mx plus b, right? This is the formula for uh, a linear function, right? And what's important about this is it tells us our y value, it tells us a y value in terms of an x value and a slope and a y intercept, right? So all this means is that when you have something, when you have a linear function, it could also, rather than it be represented on a, on a plane as a straight line, it could also be represented as this equation, right? Where your y, your y value right, is equal to your slope times the x value plus your y-intercept, right? So really what it's asking us here is what's the y value when x is equal to negative 4, right? So in order to find that y value, we're going to we're gonna use, end up using this formula because it tells us a y value in terms of x, right? Now in order for us to, uh, to, to find that, right, we're going to need to first figure out the equation of uh, this line in this graph, right? And the easiest way to do that is to find the slope and find the y-intercept, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the slope, right? Remember that the slope formula is x2, uh, sorry about that. It's going to be y2, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 over x1, right? Uh, remember to keep your 2 minus 1 and 2 minus 1 always match those up, right? So that's the slope formula. Uh, so here's what's going to happen, right? Here's our two points, right? So I'm going to say that this is uh, that uh, that this is going to be my y2, that this is going to be my y1, right? Similarly, I'm going to say that this is going to be my x2 and this is going to be my x1, right? So now that I plug this into this formula, I'm going to get um, three, sorry, let me just make that in uh, that uh, color so it's easier. So we have three, which is uh, our y2, right? Remember that that points are written in x comma y. So our y is actually our second value, not our first one. So here uh, we, have our, we have our three, and we're going to subtract this three from our y1, which is one. So we have three minus one divided by x2, which is one, minus x1, which is zero, right? So this is going to equal to two over one. Three minus one, <coughs> three minus one is two. One minus zero is uh, one, right? So really, our slope is two. So here in, in our equation, right, we can go ahead and we could write that y is equal to our slope, which is two, times our x value, which is going to be in blue, plus b, which is our y-intercept, right? So we're halfway there. So now we need to find our y-intercept, right? What is a y-intercept? A y-intercept is when your graph crosses the y-axis, right? It intercepts or it crosses path with the y-axis, right? So when we could obviously clear, we could clearly see it from here, right? When does this path cross the y-axis? It crosses the y-axis at the point zero comma one, right? In, in other terms, What's our y value when we cross the y-axis? It's 1, right? So really, our y-intercept is going to be 1. Another thing to remember about the y-intercept for the SHSAT is uh, the y-intercept occurs when x is equal to 0, right? Because the y-axis the y, uh, axis is always when x is equal to 0. So if they didn't give you a graph, but they gave you an equation, the way you would find the y-intercept is to plug in x equals zero and solve for y, right? But that's just that 
That's just being paranoid for another question. Um, so now we have our equation, right? We have y is equal to 2x plus 1. That represents this graph, right? So now we go into phase 2, step 2. Now that we know what represents that graph, all we have to do next is just plug in this value of x, right? So we have y is equal to 2 times negative 4 plus 1, right? Remember PEMDAS, uh, parentheses, exponent, multiplication. So we have to multiply first. y is equal to negative 8 plus 1. Uh, which now negative 8 plus 1 only uh, only operation left is addition so y is equal to negative 7 right so uh, if you were to draw a line straight up right continuing here and you you went uh, actually it's x is negative 4 so if you went all the way down here uh, you would you would get a point along the line which was which would be negative 4 comma negative seven <coughs> and that's how you do one of these problems right so moving on to number two and number two asks us, what is the difference in x values uh, in the graph from where the function first begins decreasing to where it begins decreasing again, right? So here uh, in this function, if we just look at it right now, right, we can clearly see that um, usually when you read a graph, you read it in increasing x value, right? That's usually how a graph works, right? So the way I'm going to be viewing this is I'm going to be viewing it increasing x value. So I'm going to be looking at it from left uh, to right, right? But that doesn't really matter in, 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 in uh, this scenario, right? Because a function decreasing and a function increasing, right? This is just when the y value goes up or goes down. Remember that a function tells you a function models the y value so when the function increases that's when the y value which is modeled by the function right the function is just the y value right the function is an equation for the y value so when the equation is increasing the y value is increasing so when the function is increasing the y value is increasing when the function is decreasing the y value is also decreasing right so don't get confused when it's talking about the function and when it's talking about a function just think about Think of this as the y value, right? <coughs> so if we look here, this y value is increasing, right? It's going up. We're going from 5 to 10. So we're not going to look at this part, right? Now here, our y value is going from 10 all the way down to negative 10, right? So this section, this section is actually uh, a span at which our y value is decreasing or our function is decreasing, right? So when it first begins to decrease is at this point, right? And now to where it begins decreasing again, right? So here, once again, we're increasing. We're increasing up here, right? Our y value is going from negative 10 to, um, to 10. And finally, we reach this point right here at which our y value goes from 10 downwards right so we begin decreasing again so we began decreasing at this point we stopped decreasing and then we uh, continued to decrease about here right so what is the difference in x values from when the function first begins decreasing to where it begins decreasing again right so we know that at this point it decreases again and at this point it decreases again right and it's asking us for the x value right the x values so what's the x value of this point well, if you look here, if you draw a line straight down, the x value here is going to be 2. And if you draw a line straight down, the x value there is going to be 12, right? And it's asking us for the difference in x values. So we're going to have to do 12 minus 2, and that's going to give us 10. So our answer here is going to be 10, right? <coughs> Moving on to number 3. It asks us, what is the value of x in the solution to the system of equations above, right? So a system of equations... Uh, what color are we going to do? We're going to do this dark blue. So a system of equations is two graphs, right? It's two linear uh, equations. And all that means is that it just, this is telling you two different lines. And, this, and, and they, they can be going any way, right? And the solution is going to be the point at which they intersect, right? So that's, that's just what a system of equations is. It's just two equations for uh, usually linear lines, right? And the system and the solution is, is the point of intersection, right? 
So now they're asking us for the value of x in the solution, right? So what does that mean? Well, the value of x in the solution is just what value of x? Like, it's the x value of the intersection, right? So if, if we think about this graphically, right, it's going to be the x value of this point right here, right? It's also going to be the x value that makes both of them equal to each other, right? Now, the key point here, right, whenever you want to solve a system of equations, you want to usually get rid of a variable or, or you want to solve for a variable and then plug that in, right? If it's asking us for the value of x here and they tell us what the value of y here, right? Notice, notice how here this says y equals 3x over 2 minus 1. And here it's telling us that x plus 2y is equal to 6, right? They already solved for y. Usually when you solve for a system of equations, uh, you want to solve, you want to get x in terms of y or y in terms of x, and you want to plug that back in, right? But here they did the heavy lifting for you. You already know what y is. So if you already know what y is and you want to solve for x, just plug in y, right? So that'll be a lot clearer. So we have x plus 2y. And here they tell us that y is equal to 3 over 2x minus 1, right? So now everything is in terms of x, and I know that it's equal to 6. So now I can just combine like terms, solve for x, right? So here I have to distribute the 2 into the parentheses. <coughs> so really, this is 3x over 2 times 2, right? So the denominators are going to cancel out. That's 1, and that's 1. So now we're left with x plus 3x, and then 2 times negative 1 is just negative 2, and this is equal to 6. Here we have x plus 3x, which is 4x, minus 2 is equal to 6. I'm going to add 2 on both sides. Right now I have 4x is equal to 8. I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides, and here I'm left with x is equal to 2, right? So the value of x in the solution is going to be 2, right? So I know at the beginning of this I was throwing a lot of around a lot of vocabulary, but all you have to do here is just plug in the expression or the equation for y into the bottom, uh, bottom one right here and just solve for x. So moving on to the uh, multiple choice questions, we're going to start off with number four. It says that the diagram above shows a pole connected to a 90 degree angle. A 17 foot wire is attached to the pole at a point eight feet out from the wall. How many feet above the pole is the wire attached to the wall, right? So if this is our pole right here, it's asking us, <coughs> so we have a wire that's attached from a wall to a pole, right? Now it's asking us, how high is that wire attached from the pole, right? So literally, it's just asking us for the height from the pole to uh the, the top of the wire, right? It's really, really, it's asking us for this purple line right here, right? Now, uh, you may be asking how do you solve this? The most important thing you can notice here is that this is a right triangle, right? It's a right triangle, and whenever we have a right triangle, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem, right? Which just says a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, right? So whenever you have a right triangle, uh, it could be represented as legs. You have two legs and you have a hypotenuse, right? The hypotenuse is always going to be the largest side and the two legs are going to be the smaller sides, right? And this guy named Pythagoras, he came up with this formula or this theorem and it says that if you square the value of the two legs and you add them together, you're going to get the same value as the hypotenuse squared, right? And A and B just re represent the two legs, right? So this can be A, and this can be B, or this can be B, and this can be A, right? That's all Pythagorean theorem says, right? So really, right here, we're missing A. They tell us B, but we're missing A, and they give us C, which is our hypotenuse, right? So all we have to do is just solve for A, right? Or rather, yeah, we have to solve for A. So we have A squared plus B squared. Here we said that b is 8 because one of our legs is 8. So we have 8 squared and this is equal to 17 squared because c, which is our hypotenuse, is 17 feet, right? So now all we have to do is simply solve for a, right? So we have a squared plus 64 because 8 squared is equal to 64. And here I'll calculate 17 squared, that's 17 times 7. 7 times 7 is 49, 4 carry, uh, 9 carry the 4. 
Uh, 1 times 7 is 7. 7 plus 4 is 11. Put a 0 there. 1 times 7 is 7. 1 times 1 is 1. This is 9. This is 8. This is 2. So this is now equal to 289. We now know that a squared, we're going to subtract 64 on both sides. We know that a squared is equal to 289 minus 64. I'll go ahead and do that here. 289 minus 64. 9 minus 4 is 5. 8 minus 6 is 2. This is now 225. So a, a squared is equal to 225. Now you have to take the square root of both sides, right? So now you're left with a is equal to 15, right? Because 15 squared is equal to 225. <coughs> so number 5 says that a researcher reported pollution data that measured the presence of potassium and nitrates in some lakes. The scatter plot shows the data which statement best describes the data shown in the graph, right? So if we just look at this graph, right, we have, a, we have a bunch of these points, and it tells us the potassium concentration in terms of the nitrate concentration, right? Now, there's no equation here, but we do see a bunch of points. And just from, just from observing this, I noticed that as you increase your potassium concentrate, you also end up increasing your nitrates, right? Think about it over here. When it's below 0 0.5, your nitrate, when your potassium concentration is below 0 0.5, your nitrate concentration is below 6, right? Uh, but if you triple that, and if your nitrate concentration is now 1.5, sorry, if your potassium concentration is now 1.5, your nitrate concentration is now 18, right? So whereas it was 6 here, the average of six here. Now, if you t multiply that by three and get 1.5, that now becomes 18, which is also the same thing as six times three, right? So <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is that I th there is a positive correlation, right? If you, could, if you couldn't already tell from the graph, the more potassium you get, the more nitrates you get, right? Here at 0 0.5, right? Or, or somewhere close to here, we had six. And at a, at a potassium concentration three times that, right, at 1.5, we had something that was roughly equal to 18, which is three times greater. So as potassium increases, nitrate concentration also increases. And what this shows is a positive association or a positive correlation, right? Uh, number A would be wrong because it is linear, right? You can kind of draw a straight linear line through here, right? You can draw, you can draw a linear equation to, to graph this, right? If it was nonlinear, you would have like points all over the place to, to where you could not not even draw a line. If it was nonlinear, then it, it would also look like curved, like it could be an exponential function, something like that. That would be nonlinear because the line of best fit would be uh, exponential, not linear. Uh, so that's why B is wrong, uh, A is wrong. The data shows multiple outliers. You don't, you can't tell outliers here really because it's just plotting all your data here. You don't know which one of these are outlier because you're not given an average and you're also not given the line of best fit. So you can't really tell what's an outlier here. And the data shows a negative association that's just false, right? Because as potassium increases, nitrates also increase. You have that upward trend. So that's why C is the right answer. Moving on to number six, it says, it asks, how much greater is 1.8 times 10 to the power of six than 7.3 times 10 to the power Five, right so never we're asking how much greater we're really just asking <coughs> sorry about that I'm a little bit sick as of recording this but that won't stop me uh, how much greater really just means it's asking you to subtract these two values right so here we have 1.8 times 10 to the power of 6 right I'm gonna rewrite that right here 1.8 times 10 to the power of 6 and here I have 7.3 times 10 to the power of 5 right so all that means is I'm multiplying this by 10 to the power of 6. I'm going to go ahead and do that, right? 10 to the power of 6 means that I have a number with six zeros. Because that's 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10, 6 times, you know? So what I'm going to have to do here is I'm going to have to take this 1.8, and I'm really going to have to move it back six times, right? So here I'm going to move it back once, twice, three, four, five, six right so really that's going to be one zero i'm adding one zero i'm adding two zeros i'm adding three zeros i'm adding four zeros i'm adding 
and now five zeros that I'm adding, right? So now I'm left with this number, one, one eight, zero, 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 right? All I did, uh, and, and the way when something is written in scientific notation like this, all you have to do is just take the exponent and then move the decimal point back by that number, right? If this is negative, then you move it forward. If it's positive, you move it back. If it's negative, you move it forward, right? So I moved it back six times and I got this number, right? Now I have to do the same thing for 7.3, right? My exponent is five, it's positive, so I have to move this move this decimal point five times to the to the right, right? So that's gonna be one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, right? So that's gonna be one, two, three, four zeros, right? <clears throat> so now I'm left with these two numbers. I'm going to have to subtract them because they're asking me how, how many times greater, or not how many times greater, but how, how much greater, right? So uh, just sub do, do some simple subtraction. That becomes a 7. That becomes a 10. Ooh, it's getting a bit sloppy. Let me rewrite this, right? 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. 0, 0. 10 minus 3 is 7. 7 minus 7 is 0. 1 minus nothing is 1, right? So now I'm left with this number, right? So really, this number is that number greater than that number. That's the difference between them. Whenever you add, whenever someone asks you how much greater, just know that you're going to have to subtract those values, right? But we're not out of the woods yet, right? We know the number, but now they're asking us to represent this uh, in scientific notation, right? <coughs> So we're just going to have to convert this big number into that silly format that we had back there. How do we do that? Whenever you have something in scientific notation, you need to express it as, an in, uh, as a, a number that's between 0 and between 10, right? So really, we're going to have to convert this into something between 0 and between 10, right? So obviously, we're going to have to convert this into 1.07, right? Because 1.07 is between 0 and 10. I can't leave this as 10 that just doesn't make sense, right? It has to be, rather, it has to be between 1 and 10. There you go. So here's what I'm going to do. My Currently, my decimal point is here. So I'm going to have to figure out how many times am I going to move back that decimal point. So I move it back one time, still too big. Move it back a second time, still too big. A third time, still too big. A fourth time, now I have 107, still too big, not between 1 and 10. I move it back another time, I get 10.7 still too big. I move back another time, I get 1.07 1 now, and all of this behind it. 1.07? Yep, that's between 1 and 10, so this is, this is now correct. I don't need to move this further anymore, right? Now I just have to count up how many times that I move this forward. Well, I moved it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. So really, this is 1.07 times 10 to the power of 6. <laughs> so that's going to be choice G, right? So that's a very simple way to solve that, right? Number 7 says, how is 0 0.6 repeating times 0 0.2 repeating written as a fraction in simplest form, right? So they're asking us, what is 0 0.66666 infinitely times 0 0.222 infinitely, right? And the trick here is that whenever you have uh, an infinitely repeating number, that could just be, that that is always represented as that number over 9. Right? So if I have a fraction that's infinitely repeating, for example, 0 0.6 infinitely repeating, that's the same thing as putting that 6 over 9. Right? 6 over 9 is equal to 0 0.6666666 infinitely. Right? That's just a rule. That's like a quirk with numbers. <coughs> so yeah. And the same thing happens with, uh, with 0 0.2222. Uh, that's the same thing as saying 2 divided by 9. Right? Whenever you have a repeating thing Repeating, des uh, repeating decimal, you could always put that number that's repeating over 9, and it's and that's the same thing as, as uh, uh, writing it as a fraction, right? So, like I just said, this is equal to 0 0.22222, 0 0.6666, and now it's asking us to multiply them together, right? So if I multiply these two together, I'm left with 2 times 6, which is 12, divided by 81, right? Now, I'm going to have simplify this right 12 divided by 81 uh, I could simplify this by taking out 3 right 12, uh, 12 is divisible by 3 and 81 is divisible by 3 
81 divided by 3 is 27, and 12 divided by 3 is 4, so this is really equal to 4 over 27. The, um, the very, very important thing here is that you know, or is that, it is that you know, uh, that whenever you have uh, infinitely repeating decimals, you could always express that as a fraction by putting the infinitely repeating decimal over 9. <coughs> so that's just a silly move. So now we have number eight, right? Yeah, we have number eight. It says that if two X minus six is equal to eight Y minus 10 and X is greater than five, what is the least possible integer value of Y? All right, so an integer is going to be a whole number, a whole number that can be negative and positive, right? So just know that. And here I have two X minus six is equal to eight Y minus 10. And it's asking us for the least value of Y. Okay. So, oh, and it also tells us that x has to be greater than 5, right? So if I want the least possible integer value of y, I'm also going to kind of have to, well, I'm going to have to have the lowest um, value of x, right? So because if you think about it this way, the smaller my x value here, the smaller that this value is, right? For example... Uh, the smallest that my x value can be is 6, right? Because 6 is greater than 5. So if this is 6, it's 12 minus 6. 12 minus 6 is 6, right? If, say if this was now 7, this would now be 8, right? So I want this side of my fraction to be equal to the smallest number, right? Because if 6 is equal to 8y minus 10, and I just solve for y... <coughs> add 10, you get 16 is equal to 8y, y is equal to 2, right? Now, think about this. If this was now equal to 8, right? Because if I plug in x is 7 into here, 8 is equal to 8y minus 10, add 10 on both sides, then we have 18 is equal to 8y, uh, divide by 8, 18 over 8, <clears throat> you can uh, divide by, by 2, you get 9 over 4, uh, 9 over 4 is the same thing as saying 2 point, 2 point something, right? 2 or, or 2 and a 1 fourth, right? Which is bigger, right? So notice, notice that the bigger my x value, the bigger my, the bigger my y value, right? I want my y, y value to be the smallest. So that means I need to make my x value the smallest. <clears throat> so in, in times like these, in questions like these rather, you always need to figure out if uh, like what you're trying to manipulate, right? So here we have two, two X minus six is equal to eight Y minus 10. And we're given a hard limit for our X value. Whenever we're given a hard value for our X, a uh, hard limit for our X value, well, we always want to test that limit out. So, so think about this, right? This side is going to have to equal to this side, right? And in order for Y to be the smallest thing it can be, this has to be equal to the smallest thing it can be, right? Because in order for this to be bigger, y has to be bigger. In order for this to be smaller, y has to be smaller, right? So I want to make this side the smallest so that this side can also be the smallest, right? And, right, I hope that makes sense for you guys, right? Because 8y minus 10, right? If this, if, if 8y minus 10 is equal to, a, to uh, <clears throat> say 10 right and and if it's equal to 12 the y value when it's equal to 12 is bigger than the y value when it's equal to 10 right so as this side increases this side also increases if that uh, if this value increases what this side is equal to then the y value also has to increase right so what all i'm trying to say is that i want to make this side equal to the smallest number possible so that my y value on this side is the smallest possible. Now, if I wanna make this side the smallest possible, I need to plug in my least possible value of x, right? And we know that x has to be greater than five, right? Since x has to be greater than five, the least possible value of x when it's an integer, which is not, not a fraction, is six, right? So, if the smallest possible value of this happens 
when you have the smallest possible value of x, and the smallest possible value of x is 6. Solve for that, right? 2 times 6 minus 6, 12 minus 6 is equal to 6, right? So the smallest possible thing value I can get this side equal to is 6, right? So now I'm left with 6 is equal to 8y minus 10. Add 10 on both sides, 16 is equal to 8y. y is equal to 2, right? So <coughs> the way I did this, answer is 2. In order for y to be smallest, this side needs to be at its smallest. That's all. Right, so number 9 says a data set relates a car's average gas mileage, y, in miles per gallon, to its engine size, x, in liters. The equation for the line of best fit is y is equal to negative 3.25x plus 3.4. What is the meaning of the slope of the line as it relates to gas mileage and engine size, right? So it gives us the car's average gas mileage in y, right? So here we have y. Let me just erase that. Uh, so we have y is equal to negative 3.25x plus 34.5. So I'm gonna now I'm gonna rewrite this in like English terms, right? So what's our what, what do you mean by English terms? I mean by what by English terms I mean like what do they tell us each value represents? So here they tell us that y in miles per gallon, right? So it, it gives us our car's average gas mileage, right? So a data set relates a car's average gas mileage, which is y, right? So average gas mileage, and this is equal to negative 3.25 times, I'll make this a different color, negative uh, 3.25, well, that's way, way too bright, I'm so sorry, uh, oh my god, you man, the colors on the, on the, this, this thing really suck, but here we go, negative 3.25, and here we have x, right, so what does x represent? x is is its engine size. <clears throat> so engine size. And then plus 34.5, right? So what, what's happening here? If I increase my engine size, I'm now increasing a negative number, which I'm adding to a positive number, right? So if my engine size is one liter, if, rather, if my engine size is 0 liters, or if x is 0, my gas mileage is 34.5. But now, if my engine size is 1 liter, 1 times negative 3.25 is negative 3.25. And if I add negative 3.25 to 3.4, that's the same thing as saying 34.5 minus 3.25. So... When I increase my engine size, I'm decreasing my average gas mileage, right? Specifically, when I increase my gas, uh, my, my engine size by one liter, I'm now decreasing my average gas mileage, which is represented here, by 3.25, right? So, which choice matches this? It's going to be uh, choice B, right? For for each increase in one liter in engine size, the gas mileage decreases by 3.25, right? Literally what I said down there. So now we're moving on to number 10. It says, on Saturday, the temperature changed at a constant rate from 2 a.m. until 2 p.m. Okay. So now at 4 a.m., The temperature was 47 degrees Fahrenheit. And at 10 a.m., the temperature was 32 degrees Fahrenheit. What was the temperature at 2 a.m. Saturday, right? So we know that between 2 a.m. and 2 p.m., we had a linear, we had a constant rate, right? The rate was always constant, right? We know that at 4 a.m., the temperature was 47 degrees Fahrenheit. And at 10 a.m., we knew that, that the temperature was 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So, between that time, what's 47 minus 32, right? Uh, so that's going to be 5, that's going to be 1. So we had a 15 degree change between those... Uh, <coughs> 
between that that period, right? Now we know that it had it it changed at a constant rate. So if you really think about this, this is kind of a point, right? We know that if we represent this in terms of temperature and time, right? So time and temp, right? We can kind of graph this out uh, whichever way it goes, right? Uh, really, 4 a.m. at 4, 47 degree Fahrenheit is the same thing as saying 4 comma 47. And 10 a.m. at three uh, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the same thing as saying 10 comma 32, right? These are two points. Uh, that can represent temperature, right? And we're, if we're dealing with a constant rate, it's going to be a linear function, which means that the slope doesn't change, right? A constant rate means, means that a slope does not change, right? So, if we want to find this constant rate, we have to find the slope. So we'll do 47 minus 32 over 10, uh, over 4 minus 10. So what's that going to give us? Uh, so 47 minus 32 is 15. That's going to give us 15 divided by uh, 4 minus 10, which is uh, negative 6, right? So we're going to have negative 15 over 6 as that constant rate. And this is equal to negative 5 over 2 if we simplify it, right? So what we did now is we recognize that it was that the, the constant rate is equal to, a, a constant rate and slope are pretty much the same thing, right? So we found the slope. And now that we know that slope, we know that it's decreasing by a rate of 5 over 2 uh, degrees Fahrenheit per hour, right? So it's decreasing by that each hour. Now it's asking us uh, to find the temperature at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, right? So we know that it, we know the temperature at when it was 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. it was at 47 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And if we're decreasing by, by a constant rate, of 5 over 2 degrees Fahrenheit per hour, and we want to find out the temperature at 2 a.m., right? How many hours pass between 4 a.m. and 2 a.m.? Two hours pass between 4 a.m. and 2 a.m. So if we have this, if we have this decreasing rate, we have if we have negative 5 over 2 per hour and two hours pass, we can do negative 5 over 2 times 2, which then gives us minus 5. So over this two-hour period, where, where we were decreasing at negative 5 over 2 Fahrenheit per hour for two hours, we can multiply that by 2, and we know that our temperature decreased by 5 degrees Fahrenheit in those two hours. So if at 4 a.m. we were at 47 degrees, and then two hours pass and we decreased by 5 degrees, we can just do 47 minus 5, and we can get 42 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature <coughs> that it was at at that time, right? So number number eleven says that if if m comma n, oh sorry, not, uh, if the line segment m n is rotated nine degrees clockwise about the origin, what are the coordinates of n prime, right? So we're rotating these two points around the origin ninety degrees clockwise. So we're just rotating them like this by ninety degrees. Uh, notice that you should know this formula, right? So a 90 degree clockwise rotation is the same thing as saying x, x comma negative y, right? So x comma negative y, that's what happens when you rotate something uh, a 90 degree rotation, right? So if our current coordinate of n is, uh, is 1 comma 0, right, our new uh, coordinate <clears throat> our new coordinate uh, should be C, right? Because that's just, if we just follow the formula around. So now we're moving on to number 12. It says that in the diagram above, STN and PRMQ are rectangles, and point S is on RM. What is the length of RT, which is this, in centimeters right so here we know that that this is a, a rectangle right and a rectangle is a quadrilateral and we also know that a rectangle has four right angles right we know that those are four right angles right now 
We also know that STNM is also a rectangle, so we know that this has four right angles, right? Now, notice how if we have one right angle here, we have to have a right angle here. Because 90 plus 90 is 180, and a straight line is equal to 180 degrees, right? So we know that RTS is a right triangle. Right T, right TT, right? So I'm gonna switch my color and then I'm gonna look at, uh, at this, right? So if I'm dealing with a right triangle, I know that I'm gonna be dealing with some form of A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, right? Whenever the SHCT throws, it, uh, throws a right triangle your way, that it's usually asking you about, uh, um, you know, a 30, uh, not a 30, <laughs> uh, the Pythagorean theorem, right? So it's asking us RT. So in order for us to find RT, we need to find A, and we need to find B, right? We need to find our two legs, so leg one and leg two. And we need to square them, and then we need to add them together, right? So this is pretty easy. We already know that uh, NM is equal to eight centimeters, right? So if we just move NM to TS, right? Because they're equal. If you look here, they align at the same points, right? Which means that TS also has to be eight centimeters if NM is eight centimeters. So this is 8 centimeters. So we know one side already. Now we know that PQ is equal to 10 centimeters, and we know that TN is equal to 2, right? So if I just draw this, this TN down, right, really, this is 2 centimeters. And if we just cut this out, right, if we just subtract TN from PQ, we know that this is also 8, right? So think about that. We just did we just did some pretty this is pretty logical, right? If this if this space is two, if we just carry this two all the way down here, and we take that two away, right, minus two, we're left with RS, which is our second leg. So now that we know that one leg is eight, the other leg is also eight. So we have eight squared plus eight squared is equal to c squared. So sixty-four plus sixty-four is equal to c squared. So 128 is equal to c squared. So that's going to be uh, C is equal to radical 128, which is choice H. Okay, so moving on to number 13. It says, in the equation above, Y is greater than 0 and N is greater than or equal to 0. So what value of X will result in the least possible value of N, right? So we know that N can be greater than or equal to 0, right? So N is greater than or equal to 0, which means that the smallest pass least possible value of N is going to be 0, right? Now it's asking us what value of x will result in the least possible value of n, right? So what's happening here? n is equal to y, which is greater than 0, which is some value greater than 0, we don't know, and we're adding it to 2x minus 1 squared, right? So if I want n to be, and the only thing I'm trying to figure out here is x, right? The only thing I can change here is x. So this y is always going to remain this y. I can't do anything about this y. I can't assume anything about this y. So I'm just going to forget that it's there, right? Because if I know that, if I if say y is 3, right? If, if y is 3 and I can't change it, but I can change my x value, right? And I want to make n the smallest. The only way that I can continue to make this the smallest when y is equal to 3 or when y is equal to whatever number it's equal to is by making x have the smallest possible value, right? If I can't change y here, if y is always going to be greater than 1, yeah, if y is always going to be greater than 1, the next thing I have to do to make n the smallest is to make 2x minus 1 the smallest uh, that it can be, right? And here I, I showed you this, right? If y is, say, 3, but I can control my x value, I want to make this equal to 0 or make this the smallest value it can be so that it doesn't add on to this 3 that's already there or so, or so it doesn't add on to the y that's already there and make n bigger, right? So I'm trying to get at here is because you can't control y, you're just going to have to deal with 2x minus 1 squared and you want to make this the smallest it can be which is of course zero right so if i want to set i want to make this zero uh just solve for x 
what value of x is going to make this 0. Because if this is 0, and if I add 0 to y, I'm just going to be left with y, right? And because y can't change, you know, that's the smallest it can be. So I'm going to take the uh, square root of both sides. I don't know why my uh, viewer is all messed up. I don't know if you can, you can see that, but there's like a delay in input. Super annoying, but whatever. Uh, anyways, so here we're just going to make, have to make this 0 in order to minimize the value of x. Right, so we're going to take the square root of both sides. Once we take the square root of both sides, we're left with 2. Oh, fixed. All right. We're left with 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. We can take that out of the parentheses. We get 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. We can add 1 on both sides. We get 2x is equal to 1. And we can divide both sides by 2. We get x is equal to 1 half, right? Why? Because when x is 1 half, this whole thing is equal to 0. When x is equal to 1 half, this whole parentheses is equal to zero. And when that whole parentheses is equal to zero, you're just left with, with y, which you cannot change, right? So now you're just left with y, and that's gonna give you the smallest possible value of n, right? If you want the smallest possible value of n, you wanna make sure that you're adding y to nothing. So you wanna make uh, x one half so that that whole thing can equal zero, right? That's number 13. That's, that's only 13 questions that they give you for this test, but uh, I know this was a very, very long video, but I, I try to go as in-depth as possible so that y'all can understand something, y'all can learn something. I hope you did learn something. Uh, when it comes to studying for the ninth grade SHSAT, just remember that it's like 80% 8th grade math and 20% like hard 8th grade math, which I like to call ninth grade questions, which is something like this. Look, I believe in you guys. If you can get really good at doing these ninth grade sample problems, I'm telling you right now, this is exactly what's on the ninth grade test, right? These are the exact same problems you'll find on the ninth grade test. So get really good with these. If you have any questions, please leave them below in the comments. If you like what you saw, please like the video. And if you want more stuff like this, please subscribe, right?